difficulty, it's often something that's an afterthought for most games. As the difficulty increases, the enemies get tougher to kill while the player gets turned into, essentially, wet paper. The most you get are behind the scene changes that aren't all that exciting. Horror games, on the other hand, are in an interesting position here. They have the unique opportunity to reintroduce the fear that you felt on a first playthrough through the use of game mechanics. Mechanics that will either change how you approach the game or just straight up changing how the player interacts with things. In a world where difficulty modes often just become stat checks of how many times do I have to shoot this guy before he dies? Horror games do it differently and I want to share some of the best examples of games that use their mechanics to give the player who love the game enough to try out a harder mode a new experience. We'll also talk about some not so great examples. So let's get started shall we? Isaac no! This is a really bad idea. I'll stick around. I'm full of bad ideas. Dead Space 2 is a decently challenging game on its own. Dead Space 2 still pulls a couple tricks and new enemies to keep you on your feet. Now, where the game's ultimate challenge lies is in its hardcore mode. In hardcore mode, the game is moderately difficult. Stronger enemies, less ammo drops, the usual. What separates this mode from everything else in the game is that you're only allowed three saves. Three saves for the entire game. Dead Space 2 has a total of 15 chapters and according to how long to beat, it takes the average player around 9 hours to beat. There's also no checkpoints in this mode, so if you let Isaac get horribly dismembered, blown up, or worse, you get sent back to your last save. But Ezzy, 15 chapters, 3 saves? You just save every 5 chapters and take your time, right? Wrong. Dead Space 2 tries to kill you at every possible chance. At the very end of chapter 1, Isaac has to face off against this tripod enemy. Now, it's chapter 1 so it can't be that bad, except it can kill you in 2 hits on hardcore. But that's only the first chapter of the game, so it's really not an issue if you die here. Making more progress, you'll be tossed through a train car, forced to defend yourself upside down, deal with an enemy that will just outright kill you this early if it gets close, and try not to get sucked into the vacuum of space resulting in instant death. This is all before chapter 5, your theoretical first save, and it only gets worse the further you get. So from the very start of the game, you're on the absolute edge. The game's usual tactics of scaring don't work anymore because you've already played it once to even unlock this difficulty, or at the very least won't be able to replicate that first playthrough. Hardcore mode re-injects that fear, not through set pieces or jump scares, but instead through gameplay. There's more at risk now your time. Without the safety of checkpoints, every encounter could be the encounter that sets you back 5 hours. Every enemy has the ability to brutally kill Isaac and you will have to lock in to avoid death at every turn. There's even a mandatory sequence near the end of the game where, if you miss a button press, Isaac just dies. You will have to truly know the game or risk dying a bunch until you do. I remember when I first attempted this challenge, I went on to game facts, game FAQs. I've honestly never heard another human being say this site out loud, so I don't know how to pronounce it. Anyway, I went there to absorb the knowledge of those who came before and plan out where I would make my saves. I just absolutely love this stuff, reading up on the intricacies and just learning more about my favorite games. Real nerd shit, you know? There's tons of threads and posts of people discussing with each other about where to save, what to look out for. And even though the game is single player, playing on hardcore, whether for the achievement or the personal challenge, turns it into a collaborative effort and a new way for players to re-experience the fear of Dead Space 2. But long before Dead Space was giving players high blood pressure with its hardcore mode, the Resident Evil series was limiting your saves, even on its most basic difficulties. Up until Code Veronica, the game only allowed you a certain amount of saves through the use of ink ribbons, and if you die, it's back to the last save. This has largely been done away with in more recent titles, but I want to talk about some exceptions. Resident Evil 7 has this difficulty called Madhouse, where of course, saving is limited, but that's not the only thing that changes. There are these antique coins that you can find and use to upgrade Ethan's health, do more damage, or get the Magnum the strongest gun in the game. Now, the question becomes, do you skulk around the house to find these coins to make yourself stronger before the first boss while Jack is actively hunting you? Or do you wait until after when he'll be gone but risk going into the boss a bit weaker? 
Or do you just forgo all the upgrades and save up for the Magnum? It's this kind of decision making that makes me fall in love with harder difficulties. I have to immerse myself more in the game and play with an active mindset instead of passively turning my brain off and just sort of going with the flow. Sometimes we play games to provide as distractions from the constant worries of life. Just like how RPG fans love to be completely engrossed in the world of the game and avid fiction readers enjoy bringing the words on the page to life with their imagination, harder game modes sometimes drag us deeper into the game world by having to plan out the next move. How you'll deal with an upcoming boss. Do you have enough ammo? Paired with more decisions to make and tougher enemies, you have to be much more involved. You get moments like these in other titles, like when Mr. X shows up in Resident Evil 2 Remake. He's essentially walking anxiety for some people, and if he shows up in the wrong hallway, things can go downhill really fast. Suddenly, you aren't invincible anymore. Resident Evil 4 does this pretty well too. Typically, in Resident Evil 4, Leon can absolutely destroy most enemies you'll run into. The game really isn't that scary when you can just... <laughs> But notice how I said most enemies. Occasionally you'll run into enemies that will remind you you're playing a horror game and that Leon isn't invincible. Near the start of the game we get introduced to the Chainsaw Man enemy and at this point he's terrifying to deal with. Armed with just a pistol, you can't reliably stun him that well and if he gets close, you're dead. As you get further into the game and get better weapons, they become easier to deal with naturally. But there's always still that lingering fear in the back of your head of getting one shot. Garridors achieve this as well, even more so on professional mode, the game's hardest difficulty. These enemies are blind and they only know where you are whenever you run or fire a gun. Professional mode turns later encounters with these enemies into an absolute nightmare by adding regular enemies to the room. This doesn't sound like much until you're now forced to play the game in a different way. You can't run around and freely evade the regular enemies without attracting the more dangerous ones. So now you have to play this interesting mini game of navigating Leon around the room, dealing with this, or you could full send it and run around hoping for the best. Or if you know this part is coming up, you could just buy a rocket launcher and call it a day. But rocket launchers cost a lot. If you do that, you have less money to buy and upgrade weapons. That's three different decisions you have to think about just from adding enemies to a room. Now so far, I've been talking about games with difficulty modes that change the game up in some way besides just turning enemies into bullet sponges by either adding new mechanics or different enemies. Either way, forcing you to play different and be more involved during play. But there's also a legendary game series that makes changes in a completely different way that I haven't mentioned yet. Changes to one of horror games most important aspects. In Silent Hill, not only can you up the difficulty of the gameplay, letting you do more of this. You can also change the difficulty of the puzzles, which was a brilliant move by Konami because let's be honest, who plays Silent Hill games for the combat? Most people are in it for the story, which is why they watch a two hour long video essay on it by their favorite YouTuber instead of actually playing the game. Moving on, Silent Hill's riddle difficulty really lets you flex your IQ level because some of the puzzles are completely different based on what level you went with. In order to properly explain, let's use an example from Silent Hill 3. There's a door that you need to unlock with a keypad. Next to the keypad is the memo that's used to find out the code. With riddle level set to easy, you basically get the directions for the proper numbers. All you need to do is figure out where to start on the keypad. In this case, you start in the middle row, since it's impossible to move up from when starting from the top row and impossible to move two spaces down if you start on the bottom row, meaning you can only start from the middle row. And by going two to the right, that means that you can only start with the number four. Pretty simple, right? On normal, you get a math riddle now instead of straight up directions. The kind of math riddle that you'd get on a high school test where your math teacher would ask you to show your work. This requires a bit more thought, but nothing too outrageous, and I'll spare you my thought process this time. 
Now we've come to the hard level puzzle, which is a fucking long, disturbing poem about someone's face. With no numbers. Who would even think of doing something so disgusting? Through this long, disgusting poem, you have to figure out the combination. The key to this is to think of the keypad as a person's face, and every time the poem mentions tasting from the face, that's them entering a number. Ill. So for example, the writer says, biting your tongue, shredding it. The tongue is located in the mouth, and your mouth is the bottom middle of your face, which in this case is the number 8. We went from the game essentially giving us the answer to a typical number riddle to a full-blown poem that has nothing to do with numbers. Each of these difficulty levels engage your brain just that much more. Hard mode may be a bit much, but hey, it's a chance to finally prove that your 300 IQ is real and a chance to be more engaged with the gameplay in a way that doesn't have anything to do with tougher enemies or less items. And that's just brilliant. You know what's not brilliant though? Difficulty modes that just straight up suck the fun out of the game. I'm talking about you, Resident Evil Village. In RE Village, which I'm going to call RE8 from now on so I don't have to say the word village 1000 times, there's a difficulty mode called Village of Shadows, and when I tell you it's the most absurd challenge in a Resident Evil game ever, I'm not joking. This mode is so ridiculous that 99% of people will tell you to only try it on New Game Plus with infinite ammo because everything is so tanky and refuses to die. The most optimal way to get through the mode is to beat the game on a lower difficulty, purchase this magnum that only becomes available on NG+, beat the game again so you have enough money to fully upgrade the magnum because you can only get infinite ammo for weapons that are fully upgraded, then you can start Village of Shadows. While you can definitely beat Village of Shadows without the use of infinite ammo, there's not much to look forward to in the mode, especially when compared to Resident Evil 7's Madhouse mode that we talked about earlier. Village of Shadows doesn't really change up item placement. The only change is that enemies are more aggressive and you'll encounter late game enemies way earlier. There aren't any new systems to interact with like the coin upgrades in Madhouse or the limited amount of saves in Dead Space 2 Impossible mode. You just get to shoot at enemies more and hope they don't get too close because you'll die insanely fast. While you would think this would make for a more tense experience, you're just doing more of the same. Especially when to even play on this mode requires you to beat the game at least once. There's no renewed fear and there's nothing engaging about the main difference between your hardest mode and normal being it takes 30 bullets to kill a guy instead of 10. Alien Isolation kind of has some of the same issues, but to a lesser degree. As you go up in difficulty, enemies become smarter and tougher to kill, just like normal. But the Alien, the game's best feature, also gets smarter. The Alien will wise up to your tactics, forcing you to change how you play the game as you progress. Have you been relying on the Noisemaker item to distract the Alien too much? Well, after a while, the Alien will start to go where the Noisemaker was thrown from instead of where it landed. Looking at the motion tracker to find out where enemies are, better not look at it too long because the alien can hear it beeping. On harder difficulties, the same strategies that the player was using on chapter 3 will not work on chapter 12. You have to constantly change as the apex predator aboard the space station constantly adapts to whatever you throw at it. The devs were kind of forced to innovate here because the alien will kill you in one shot if it finds you no matter what difficulty. So you can't make it stronger or have more health. Instead, they had to work around that and change how the alien gets to that point where it can kill the player. There's another conversation to be had about 90% of the interactions that you end up having with the alien will be it killing you and resetting you back to the nearest checkpoint, causing some players to replay the same section dozens of times because they can't get past the alien, making the game lose some of that shine. Can you tell I died a lot? Alien Isolation does indeed make a guy go from 10 bullets to kill to 30 bullets, but it also beefs up the alien, forcing you to play differently, so the game kind of gets a pass for me, because it does both. Difficulty is something that's important for every video game, but more so for horror games. Once you finish the first playthrough of a horror game, that initial shock and mystery is gone. The player will already know what the game is going to throw at them and jump scares become just another scene to skip or run past. 
on subsequent playthroughs, you have to rely on the game mechanics now in order to reignite that fear, whether it be through subtle changes or massive ones that completely change the game and how it's played. Now, I'm not saying that you can't have fun playing horror games on easy modes. Different difficulty modes are for different people, accessibility and all that. As long as you're having fun, who cares? But if there's a game that you love that you might feel like that charm was lost a bit because you've played it so much, maybe try it on a harder difficulty. You might just fall in love with it all over again. Thank you for watching. Until next time.